Hi everyone, I'm Eric Edman, and today for DMTV, we will be exploring one of the many campaigns that our movement is involved in. It's called Stop Trade with Illegal Settlements. For the past 50 years or so, Israel has systemically occupied and colonized Palestinian land in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, with something like 700,000 settlers currently living there. Just last month, in fact, uh, the government of Israel has approved plans to build a further 4,000 illegal settlements in the West Bank alone. Now, in the face of this seemingly unstoppable Israeli policy, the international community has repeatedly condemned the illegal settlements, but with little real effect on the ground in Palestine. Um, in fact, Infant Amnesty International uh, joined other actors, including DiEM25, in calling the Israeli state an apartheid state. So there is a shift in the rhetoric around the world, but little real effect in practice for the lives of Palestinians. On the other hand, the European Union does in theory oppose annexation of, uh, of, of, of occupied land and the building of illegal settlements um, and considers that an obstacle to international peace and stability as well it should because it, indeed illegal settlements are according to international law a war crime. However, in practice, the EU does allow trade with illegal settlements, making the importing of goods uh, and the exporting of goods to illegal settlements and services legal. Now, what this means is that essentially the annexation of land becomes economically profitable for aggressors and thus contributes to the expansion of illegal settlements, not just in uh, occupied Palestine, but uh, in many similar um, cases around the world. Which brings us to the campaign that DiEM25 has joined, together with dozens of other organizations from Europe and across the world. Stop Trade with Illegal Settlements is a campaign that calls for an EU law created by the European Commission that will force the European Union to put its money where its mouth is by making trade with illegal settlements illegal. This law would apply to occupied territories, of course, in um, occupied Palestine and the illegal Israeli settlements there, but indeed across the world. And it would send a powerful signal across the whole planet that the European Union stands by its principles in practice, not only in rhetoric, and will make the um, annexation of lands uh, by uh, oppressors and aggressors uh, economically uh, less profitable. So with us today to discuss this and uh, th this particular topic, we have firstly uh, Senator Frances Black from Ireland. She's a musician, a qualified addiction counselor and a politician. She was the first independently elected woman to the Irish Senate where she sits since 2016. And she's also the founder of Rise Foundation, an organization that sets up support for families who have loved ones struggling with alcohol, drug and gambling addiction. Hi Frances, welcome to the show. Hi, Good can you hear me? Sorry, I was just on mute there. Lovely to see you, Eric. How are you? Lovely to have you with us. And uh, secondly, we have Omar Shakir. He is the Israel and Palestine Director for Human Rights Watch. A, he has a long record of championing human rights across the world, having worked on topics ranging from US drone, drone strikes in Pakistan and the killing of prosecutors in Egypt to legal representation for Guantanamo detainees and, of course, human rights violations in West Bank and Gaza. Omar holds a BA in International Relations and a JD from Stanford University, as well as an MA in Arab Studies from Georgetown University. Hi, Omar. Welcome to DMTV. Thank you for having me. Great to be with Senator Black. No, it's honestly a pleasure to have you both with us. Um, and let's get straight to it. So I'll start with you, Francis, if that's all right. Right. One of the reasons why you're here and we're going to have this conversation is because back in 2018, you tabled a private member's bill from your position as Irish Senator, which sought to essentially prohibit the import and sales of goods and natural resources from illegal settlements in occupied territories. Mm -hmm. um, this resulted in, among other things, also the summoning of the Irish ambassador to Israel by Netanyahu, if I remember reading correctly. Um, why don't you tell us a bit more about this particular bill, how it was received and what happened to it since then? Yeah, sure. Well, the Occupied Territories Bill was introduced, as you said, to the to the Senate in, in early 2018. And 
I, I was one of the sponsors, obviously, along with my colleagues in the civil engagement group. Um, I had, there's four of us in the, at the time there was five. Um, and we're all independents. And I suppose this was a, this bill was a result of, of a collaboration between my office where I had Conor O'Neill working with me at the, t at the time and Sadaka, which is the Ireland uh, Palestine Alliance. Um, and Jerry Liston was, was working with them at the time. And the bill really, I suppose, was inspired by our strategic thinking about Western inaction on Israel's decades long impunity in the face of international law. So like it, it continuously violates international law in so many ways and including its de facto annexation of the occupied Palestinian territories. Um, it's, it, it's transfer of civilian population into, into occupied territories and, and countless other offences. So over half, as you well know, over half of all UN resolutions condemning violations of international law by a member state concerning Israel, and yet in practical terms, they suffered no consequences. So Ireland has been one of the most vocal Western critics of Israeli human rights abuses, and the Irish people in particular are passionately supportive of Palestinian um, liberation um, because of our own history, I suppose, of, of, of anti-colonial resistance. But unfortunately, um, a success of Irish governments have failed to take concrete action. Um, so our, our, our strategy was to to, 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 to disrupt this cycle of condemnation and inaction by, by presenting a proposal um, containing the minimum possible demand, um, which was banning goods originating in the settlements that are universally recognised as illegal. Um, and and it could, thought this could force the Irish government and perhaps other governments to turn their words into action, their words of condemnation into action. So this bill, it's not full... BDS, which which if it had been full BDS, it would have got voted down immediately. So, like we believed that by making such a modest demand, the pressure on the government would be increased because they couldn't really articulate a plausible reason to say no. So, just to give you, a, I suppose, a quick outline of what happened, um, the bill quickly passed all stages of the Senate. Um, in the final stage of this process, I have to tell you, I was joined by two Palestinian farmers, Fayez and Muna al Tanib, who traveled to Ireland to speak about the impact of Israeli colonization on their lives and to support the bill. And I have to say their presence in the Shannon Chamber was, was so powerful and it was a powerful reminder of, of what we're fighting for. And then the bill was then um, introduced into the Dáil, um, which by Niall Collins of Fianna Fáil. So this is pre-election, pre-last election. Um, and at that time, Fianna Fáil were in opposition. It passed its first vote in the Dáil by a wide margin, supported by all political parties except for Fianna Gael and some of the independent D TDs who were supporting its minority government. And it also passed an important vote in the Foreign Affairs Committee before stalling in committee stage. So the bill passed seven out of ten stages required in the parliament before legislation is sent to the president to sign into law. Um, it could be implemented rapidly if the political will was there, but unfortunately, all progress was halted because of the current, current government. And obviously there was an election. And we do you know, know that... The understanding is that the law is in limbo. It's not... It, well, it's back, on, it's back on the order paper. It's back it on is. the order paper. It's still there. It's not gone. So I just need to say that, and I think that's very important. So it's, there was an election called, unfortunately, uh, it didn't make the last three stages. Um, so unfortunately, but it is back on the order paper. And like we do know that the Occupy Territories Bill played a role in the negotiations for the formation of the government. Early drafts of the programme for government included a bill with the question mark next to it. But ultimately, again, as I say, Fianna Gael were adamant and um, adamantly opposed to its inclusion and Fianna Fáil and the Green Party support, which supported the bill previously, gave in to them. So we're still fighting for this bill, but ultimately it will almost certainly require a change of government to progress. Do you have any indication um, from the parties most likely to make government in Ireland? Um, well, 
Sure, according to the poll, it's looking like Sinn Féin are doing extremely well in the polls at the moment. They're leading. So if I would imagine if if Sinn Féin, or Sinn Féin um, get elected, I think the bill will pass straight away. Thanks for that. We'll come back to this topic. Um, but first, let's go to Omar. Now, Omar, like Francis basically said, it often feels like Israel is essentially unstoppable. No amount of international condemnation seems to really stall their uh, expansion into the occupied territories and in general, the brutal treatment of, of Palestinians. Um, if I remember correctly, you were even expelled in 2018 from Israel because of your work and your political background. So, you know, with this in mind, what parts do we really have available, similar to what Francis has described in what she did in Ireland, um, in order to put real pressure on Israel, not simply in order to um, virtue signal, but really to, to affect change for what is happening um, in Israel and the occupied territories? I think banning the trade of settlement goods globally would have an incredible you know, impact in terms of starting to move the ledger towards the start of human rights based measures that a situation of this gravity warrants. And let's be crystal clear. There is consensus across international lawyers that the transfer of one's civilian population to territory required by war, that's verbatim out of the Fourth Geneva Convention, you know, is a war crime. It's defined as such under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. So when you're doing trade with settlements in occupied territory, you're helping to sustain these violations of international humanitarian law. Moreover, you're helping to sustain human rights abuse because settlements, by their very nature, rob indigenous communities of their land, of their resources, of their livelihoods. They're in invariably universally linked to displacement and discrimination. So I think it's critically important globally uh, that there is a ban on trade in or with settlements. Um, and I think what we're seeing happening in the Ukraine is we're seeing some countries defending this principle. Uh, in terms of uh, what it means to be under occupation, what the human rights abuses, you know, are there. And I think we need to sort of take the playbook from Ukraine and actually apply it much more globally, right? I mean, if you've seen the way the world has reacted, whether it is about accountability, the resources the International Criminal Court has put in there. I mean, if you land in Europe, I was just in London, you know, last week, you land in, in there, you see signs. If you have evidence of crimes against humanity and war crimes, report them to the police. If you've seen uh, the initiatives that have taken place to end complicity with Russia's aggression in Ukraine, if you look at the steps taken, uh, you know, around uh, um, similar initiatives, you'll see quite a bit of momentum. For those principles to be valid in Ukraine, they need to be valid everywhere where the similar principles are invoked. And I think the European Citizens Initiative is exactly the sort of measure that brings to bear this, this type of uh, human rights-based toolkit. I think Israel-Palestine is a natural place where I would apply, as you noted, Human Rights Watch and um, is one of many organizations. There's a consensus now in the global human rights movement that Israeli authorities are committing crime against humanity you know, of apartheid. There's a UN a uh, special rapporteur who endorsed this finding. It's gone beyond even civil society groups to the former UN Secretary General, foreign ministers of France and Luxembourg, for nearly 400 European parliamentarians. And uh, so there is quite a bit of consensus around that. And when you have a situation of that gravity, there needs to be efforts to end complicity in them. But this bill is not, this initiative is not just unique. And by the way, there's hundreds, you know, uh, several hundred million dollars of trade you know, that go between, uh, you know, that go between you know, Israel and Europe and some, much of that, according to data, it comes from settlements, a good uh, percentage of that. But more than there, you can look at Western Sahara, you can look at even, you know, Iraq after the coalition invasion, and oil exploitation. There are a number of other scenarios in which a similar legal framework can advance um, human rights protection. And the last thing I'll just say is, of course, when we're talking about Israel-Palestine, I do think there's a, there's a value in calling things by their name, recognizing reality for what it is. Uh, and apartheid is the reality for millions of Palestinians. And calling it as such, I think, is critical to getting to the point where we're taking human rights-based measures, such as targeted sanctions on those Israeli officials implicated, 
uh, criminal prosecutions and investigations and prosecutions, as well as evaluating all forms of bilateral engagement with Israel to ensure non-complicity in these crimes. Thanks, Omar. This is true in something that we've also identified with our own work. For example, we were very active in uh, opposing the uh, the deal with Turkey for refugees um, between European states and the EU, essentially, and, and Turkey. Um, and it's really, really saddening, to put it mildly, to see the difference in approach to refugees between the way Ukrainians have been accepted with open arms, as well they should be fleeing war, um, and the way essentially every other people on earth are left to drown in the Mediterranean, based on Fortress Europe, and the sort of approach that Europe has taken to refugees. Um, so there is this kind of semi-duplicitous, semi-hypocritical approach that, that the European Union has taken. And as you say, it's very important to, to take the, the positive um, example and use that as the foundation for how we should be treating this sort of thing universally as a block. Now, on this, uh, actually, I'll leave this topic for later because I want to come back to you on this. I'll go back to uh, Francis. Um, what you describe with the law that uh, you promoted and, and the work that you've done, of course, as an Irish senator, is all Irish-centric, uh, and that is understandable. That is indeed your work, Irish decision-making. But, of course, to put pressure on a state such as Israel with the kind of powerful support that the state of Israel has um, requires more than bilateral relations. It's not just up to Ireland, essentially, to, to fight this fight. And maybe, Omar, you can come back to this with maybe examples from other countries who have done similar moves to try and pressure Israel, other positive examples that you might have uh, from other countries. Um, but uh, Francis, what I want to get to is, uh, in, in terms of what you're doing with this bill and beyond it, what role does the global, the European, the international dimension take? And how essentially does an Irish senator think, act locally, but think globally? Yeah, well, I suppose um, Ireland is a is a very small island on the far western edge, and 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 one can often feel insignificant when con con confronting the immense scale and bureaucratic complexity of of European and international institutions, particularly when you're just you know an independent senator, um, you don't have that big full party behind you. But for me. It's absolutely vital to not feel discouraged. Um, and I suppose I take my inspiration from, you know, well, first of all, the international movement against apartheid, say, in South Africa is obviously a, a, a touchstone for so solidarity, for Palestinian solidarity activism. And that movement, which saw small local campaigns boycotting South African go goods um, grew, grow into a massive social movement that got huge companies and state concerns to di divest from apartheid and convinced a broad range of states to apply economic sanctions that precipitated the collapse of the apartheid regime. So in Ireland, it was the actions of a few shop workers led by a, 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 an amazing, inspiring woman uh, called Mary Manning, who went on strike for, for several years, uh, refusing to handle South African uh, produce um, that saw the Irish state ban in, imports of South African food products in 1986. And that was one of the most radical steps taken by a Western country at that point and proved to be extremely influential. So... Like, I mean, ideas can spread far and wide and, and, and in, a, in a negative sense, we've seen how the pro-Israel lobby has been successful in spreading repressive legislation, limiting Palestine, Palestine solidarity activism across the US and in certain parts of Europe. And I hope that the movement for justice in Palestine can counteract that by sharing strategies and legislative frameworks. I'm, I'm very heartened by the international interest in, in my bill. And I've spoken about it at the UN and lawmakers in Belgium and Chile are currently working on legislation inspired by it. 
And I hope that it can provide a framework for, for activists hoping to make their governments commit to taking concrete action against the settlements. Like, I mean, in recent decades, Ireland has subsumed much of its foreign policy initiative to the EU. It, 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 it has muted its criticism of human rights abuses across the world as it seeks to align itself with Western diplomatic and military priorities. And I hope that Ireland can reverse this trend and regain its voice and its sense of independence and serve as a, as a tribune for nations and people resisting, you know, repression, co colonialism and violence around the world. And I think the Occupied Territories Bill would be a useful tool in achieving this, this aim. I look forward to the day when we see it enacted and the Irish state begins to, to live up to its promise. Yeah, as do I, and I'm sure all of us involved in this campaign, and not only. Um, however, and this maybe is also a question for Omar, I don't know how much of your work revolves around European legislation, because one of the tools used uh, for the campaign of um, stop trade with illegal settlements is an ECI. Um, and for our viewers, that is a European Citizens Initiative, essentially a tool uh, of the European Union, uh, essentially of the European Commission, to allow European citizens to collect uh, signatures around a particular topic that they wish to see uh, enacted into law. So drafted by the European Commission and then presented to the European Parliament. Now, this uh, is something of, um, uh, for some of us at least, uh, considered a bit of a democratic pariah because although it exists and it is um, on the surface a democratic tool that allows citizens direct influence over decision making, um, it has been uh, quite in, inefficient and unsuccessful in creating any kind of change. All ECIs that have been pursued by European citizens have, for one reason or another, essentially failed. So it'd be interesting to hear from both of you if you consider ECIs really a, a powerful tool for creating this kind of change or whether it is only a sort of an additional tool as part of a broader campaign. And also bringing you back, Omar, to this question of whether there are any other interesting initiatives on the same topic, other pieces of the puzzle, such as the one that Francis is offering from Ireland. Yeah, so let me start by saying I'm not an expert on European policymaking, uh, but I am an expert on international law and what it requires around Israel-Palestine. European Commission should be regulating this on, the, on their own. I mean, Europe has, European Union, EU member states have a clear position on the illegality of settlements. They have a clear position on abuses that stem from settlements, but frankly, they have failed to put their money where their mouth is. It's shameful that, you know, uh, according to reassessment, $300 million of trade, you know, between settlements and, and Israel proper. And I think this is easy to regulate. That's what, you know, uh, I think the EU was created precisely to do the kind of work of regulating, you know, goods that are the product of violations of international law and human rights should not be traded on the European market, right? That's just such a very bedrock principle. Since the EU and the European Commission aren't doing this, then I support all initiatives that allow citizens to take uh, their fate in their own hand and to try and sort of force the hand uh, like this ECI is trying to do, because ultimately they're acting given the failure of the European Commission that, and by the way, even if they get uh, a million signatures, and Human Rights Watch is proudly one of the nearly 100 plus organizations that have endorsed the ECI, even if it gets a million signatures, all they're compelling the commission to do is to, to, to take this question up. It doesn't necessarily dictate, uh, you know, an outcome, but in terms of what else is happening out there, I think, um, you know, Senator Black mentioned Belgium, um, not only a bill like this, but Belgium is also passed a clear government policy around differentiation or in essence, distinguishing between goods that come from Israel proper versus those in illegal settlements in the occupied you know, territory. There's a similar initiative that um, experts think is likely to pass in Chile. I think those are two really, really good examples. But beyond that, I think you're, you're seeing that there are now some important initiatives in the international fora. So the International Criminal Court has a formal investigation into serious crimes committed in Palestine. There have been a number of states um, that have taken stands in support of the court's independence amid attacks, uh, you know, by numerous, led by the U.S. under Trump, but they, they've continued, that have sought to, um, you know, uh, block the court from exercising its mandate, which is precisely to have a forum to hold perpetrators of serious crimes to account where there is no other domestic remedy for these crimes. 
Uh, there's also a commission of inquiry that the United Nations established last year to look into not only uh, the events of last year, but also the root causes of the recurring conflict. That commission um, has just released its uh, most its first report uh, that will be debated at the um, you know UN Human Rights Council. There will be um, further reports. It has a standing mandate to look at abuses on both sides of the green line. We saw so much of the world after the killing of Shireen Abu Akhla call for independent investigations and accountability and even highlighting the larger context. And we have a now a UN mechanism. It was a shame that European states that were on the Human Rights Council um, either abstained or voted against the, the creation of that commission. It's critical that they support its work. Uh, European states have supported uh, such initiatives. Every other time they've come up to the Human Rights Council, unanimously voted in favor of them. So why is there a double standard on Israel-Palestine? And the last thing I'll say is in terms of apartheid, um, we now have a situation where the entire African group led by South Africa and Namibia, but Cote, uh, uh, Ivory Coast, the African Union heads of state, all of whom have now used apartheid in terms of their classification of the reality on the ground. The Organization of Islamic Conference has done the same, as has the Arab group. Between, I mean, there's some overlap between those bodies, obviously, but we're talking between them of, of maybe close to 100 states. Um, so I think we have states that are now willing to make this classification. Most of those states obviously aren't selling arms uh, you know, to Israel, they're not um, complicit in other, you know, abuses linked to the apartheid reality. But I think other states need to take the cue, you know, and they need the first step, Eric, to solving a problem is to diagnose it correctly. The wrong diagnosis leads to the wrong conclusion. So we need European states uh, to recognize the reality for what it is. Again, we have some models with um, statements by former European leaders, by parliamentarians, and even now, the foreign ministers of Luxembourg and France have acknowledged public statements or referenced apartheid. We need that to happen. And then we need the steps to be taken that are commiserate with a crime of that gra uh, gravity. Remember, crimes against humanity are crimes against me. They're crimes against you. They're crimes against all of us. Thanks, Omar. Absolutely. I mean, you, you really beat me to one of my follow-up questions, which was essentially in general, this track record of the European Union when it comes to human rights, especially in Israel, but across the board, really, because it is one of these medals of honor that the EU wears on its chest when it goes to the negotiating table anywhere, that it is one of its core principles and the rest of it. But then, of course, when it comes to practice, all these big interests that essentially many of the governments and indeed as a bloc, the European Union serve complicate matters and makes the reality quite different to the rhetoric, as we see in the case of uh, of Israel, but not only. Uh, Francis, would you like to also come in uh, with any comment on this? Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not an expert either by any means on, on anything, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, but yeah, I mean, I suppose it is concerning, there's no doubt about it, um, that we don't see, you know, I suppose proper um you know what what omar said earlier about what's going on and what's happening with ukraine and the fact that you know there's obviously you know banning goods from from russia and there's it, it, the hypocrisy really for me uh can be soul destroying i suppose but in saying all of that um we must and I think this is for me when the first time that I sat in on a meeting and, and I met with, you know, some Palestinian people, they came to Leinster House um, and I heard the story and what they were going through. And I just felt the hopelessness, just I almost was overpowering until one woman said, we must never, ever, ever give up hope. We must keep going. And I really believe that would be, for me, the most important message out of today. You know, it's the people can make change. And I think it's so important that people feel empowered to take action for justice in Palestine. And I think, you know, the best antidote to that feeling of despair that we all feel from time to time is activity. And I would ask the people who are watching this today to, you know, please come on board with us, get involved. Being involved in activist work with like-minded people for good cause can be totally transformative, you know. And, you know, I would say to people to 
maybe seek out their local Palestine, you know, solidarity, solidarity act, activist groups where, where, where they live, you know, because they really are doing vital work and can always do with getting more support, you know. And I, and I also think, and again, and I'm, I'm only talking here from my own experience of when we were, you know, trying to get support from from the government back in 2018, from the from the opposition parties, not from the government, but from the opposition parties. And, you know, we had we had public meetings all around Ireland and we were amazed at the amount of interest and passion that Irish people had for the situation in Palestine. And what we did was we got people to lobby their their elected representative on this issue and it really worked it really really paid off i mean too often you know politicians and political parties believe that voters are not motivated by issues of foreign policy and and and, and this means they they can take destructive or or negligent positions and believe they won't experience a political cost but persistent activism and lobbying on the issue of Palestine makes it harder for politicians to ignore, which is crucial. I can't tell you how, how important that is. You know, and it's the voice of the people that they listen to. And that's why we must never, ever, ever give up. You know, and I also think, can I just say as well, another great way of taking action is, is by signing the, the, the European Citizens Initiative to, to ban trade with illegal settlements. You know, this initiative is, 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 is a process that compels the European Commission to consider, you know, initi initiating legislation if it supported the, set, the signatures of one million EU citizens of the course of a year. Could you imagine the power of that? I mean, it's, it's just phenomenal. And, you know, the, like this campaign demands that the EU adopts a ban on the importance of goods produced in the EU you know, or, or, or in the illegal settlements, sorry, in occupied territory. So it's like, it's it's really, really powerful. I mean, you know, it's vitally important because the EU recognises the illegality of these settlements. And yet, again, here I am saying it again, has taken no action to limit trade with them. It's, it's, it's shocking, really. And it's not only negligent, it's essentially it actually essentially rewards Israel for its crimes by buying goods produced on stolen land. The EU is, is Israel's biggest trade partner. Much of that trade is agricultural products produced in the, in the occupied West Bank. So, look, if the, if the EU respects the principle of international law and the rights of Palestine, it will act. If the EU sees trades with settlements, it would undermine their economic viability and put massive financial and diplomatic pressures on Israel to comply with international law. And this represents one of the most viable ways of, of, of halting the expansion of settlements across the West Bank. And I, and I really would urge anybody who is watching this today to, you know, to get involved, sign up for the European Citizens Initiative, Please share it with your family, friends, other like-minded people. We really need to get this over the line to force the European Commission to confront the, the glaring inconsistencies between EU policies and condemn settlements in occupied territory while continuing to, to trade with them. So, I, I mean, I would just say we must never give up. And, you know, certainly here in Ireland, we're embarking on, you know, starting up just like what happened back in the 80s to start up a campaign on apartheid. Um, and, you know, I have no doubt we're going to be meeting with a lot of the unions next week and um, with a lot of the NGOs. Um, the people of Ireland are just waiting. They're waiting to see what can we do. Um, so we would hope that that would kind of spread throughout other countries. So I hope that answers your question. Oh, absolutely. And then some. Um, it, it is, it's true that essentially pessimism and hopelessness are mm -hmm. the biggest enemies of change. And absolutely. often they are barriers that we put in front of our own minds. They might not even reflect reality. 
but they reflect a kind of constructed reality created mm -hmm. by the people who oppose that change. Mm -hmm. And as you've said, once we can overcome the kind of mental block, a lot of things that seemed impossible are all of a sudden uh, very possible indeed. So completely agree with that. And even if the ECI does not lead, and it's indeed sad, the day is sad when an ECI is needed to persuade the European Commission to do its job. <laughs> um, but here we are. But even if it doesn't lead to the European Commission doing its job, it can still lead to the elevation of this particular topic uh, mm -hmm. in the minds and in the con in the minds of Europeans in the common discourse mm -hmm. of, of Europe in general, which is a victory in and of itself, mm -hmm. because that is the foundation on which governments are elected, members of parliament are elected, and, and change can happen. So still very important. Um, Omar, we spoke about the ECI. Um, we spoke about decision making. Do you have any final parting words, anything else that people who might uh, be watching us could do in order to stand in solidarity with uh, people in Palestine, people suffering from uh, illegal settlements and occupation around the world? Well, listening to your comment, your exchange reminds me that and a, a quote of Nelson Mandela, I believe, from his book, it always seems impossible until it's done. And actually, I know many of us followed with horror the killing of the journalist Shireen Abu Akhla, uh several weeks ago. And actually, um, you know, rightfully, the international media focused on the uh, brutal way in which uh, Israeli authorities beat uh, the, uh, those that went to her funeral procession. But actually, for many Palestinians, it was one of those moments of triumph, because despite the brutality, despite Israel's sweeping movement restrictions, right, two million Palestinians in Gaza that are basically caged in an open air prison, 40 by 11 kilometers. You have the West Bank Palestinians that can't enter occupied East Jerusalem that are hard to get permit. You have the millions of refugees that can return to their homes. You still have this massive demonstration in the heart of Jerusalem where people raised Palestinian flags and felt that they had this moment of triumph and that it was Shireen, even in her death, that you know brought together Palestinians. So it was one of those moments that showed the fragility of Israel's repression and showed that sometimes, uh, you know, you keep pushing, you keep pushing, and sometimes these things shift. So I think when it comes to a European citizen, look, signing the ECI is it's not even about solidarity with Palestinians. It's the lowest common denominator. It's about your own complicity. It's about the fact that you could be unwillingly, you know, you know, going to your grocery store and, you know, purchasing uh, goods that are uh, coming from land, you know, that were grown on land stolen from Palestinians you know, delivered by roads, some of which might be Israeli-only roads that Palestinians can't use, you know, that are being provided to Israelis while Palestinians are denied infrastructure and basic resources. You're talking about then providing money that goes to businesses that further entrench, you know, settlements that go to a two-tiered uh, labor system. You're talking about businesses and settlements. You have Israelis, even when there are Palestinian workers who work there in large part because, you know, uh, their occupation has eliminated, eliminated so much of the viable economic opportunities. They're subject to different bodies of laws, right? Israelis governed under Israeli civil law and Palestinians that are governed under uh, harsh military, draconian military rules. So, you know, that's what we're talking about here. So I don't even see signing the ECI as a terribly, uh, uh, you know, brave stand. It's just, it's about actually being not linked to, to one perspective or the other. Now, for those that want to do more than the sort of baseline, I think there are a number of things you can do. Um, you know, I think pushing your own, look, the reality is there are many people in the European Parliament, there are many people in domestic in parliaments like Senator Black that want to take action on Palestine, but, you know, are afraid of the domestic political repercussions. It's important they hear uh, from their constituents that these issues matter to them. Uh, it's important they hear your voices. And also when it comes to like the apartheid discussion, we're at the stage right now where, we're, we're, you know, it is uh, increasingly a matter of consensus among the human rights movement and beyond. But we need other voices. We want, uh, you know, uh, everyday people to use the term to push their churches, their labor unions, their uh, professors, their representatives uh, to use the term. Because when you use the term, uh, invariably, uh, it leads to greater recognition, and it goes to the heart of the problem. In Europe, people still think of Israel-Palestine as, you know, two warring, you know, states, and that there's a peace process, and if only they could sit around the table, this could be resolved. 
But, you know, a 55-year occupation is not temporary, right? Uh, you know, ruling over millions of people denied their basic rights is not democracy. Um, you know, uh, depriving millions of people their basic rights because of who they are isn't just a matter of, a, a, of an abusive conflict. A state that's engaging in daily structural violence and repression against millions of, of Palestinians is not a conflict between two equal sides. So we need to understand the reality for what it is. It's, it's, it's a situation of grave human rights abuse, and we need the right set of tools to deal with that. And I think everyday citizens, you might not be able to change government policy. You may not be able to change, stop an Israeli bulldozer from demolishing a Palestinian home or an Israeli soldier who blocks a, a Palestinian child from getting to their school. But you can, you know, play a role in, um, you know, normalizing the accurate description of this situation. And then in pushing your representatives to take the sorts of measures that international law sets out for a situation Thanks, Omar. It's absolutely true. And at the end of the day, one of the quotes that we use a lot in the end comes from your neighboring Britain, actually, Francis, um, from an MP, Tony Benn, who said that there's no final victory and there's no final defeat. And that is the kind of concept that really should be underlying the entire human experience. So you can never stop. You can't allow yourself to stop. And at the very least, um, to be on the right side of history, not to be complicit with crimes, let alone empowering them or, uh, you know, enabling them um, is incredibly important. And that can start with signing an ECI and it can end with, you know, presence in the street, with reaching out to your uh, representative, with taking the kind of measures and steps in your own life to ensure that you have a life that doesn't have a negative impact on these people who suffer. Um, and, and, and being aware that is really the first step and then the rest follows from that. Um, any final remarks from you, Francis, before I wrap up? Yeah, I mean, I just really want to kind of, I suppose, reiterate what Omar said there. I mean, we had Michael Link um, over who was, the, who was the UN Special Rapport, Rapporteur for Human Rights um, in, in, in Palestine. And he was over here about five, in Ireland about five or six weeks ago. And he'd been meeting with different groups in the Oireachtas, you know, in our parliament, urging them to take action on a national and international level to deal with Israel's breaches of international law. And, you know, as Omer said, and I, I just want to highlight, I want to really finish on this. One key feature of the special rapporteur's final report is that it, it, it affirms the recent findings from Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch that is that Israel is practicing the crime of apartheid. Like in international law, apartheid is defined as a systematic racial oppression and discrimination, including inhuman acts such as torture or population transfer that, that facilitates one group's dominance over another. So the growing consensus is that Israel is inflicting apartheid on the Palestinians. Um, it has the potential I believe, to shift the global discourse on Israel-Palestine from the dead consensus of the two-state solution and the peace process to, to a real interrogation of the two-state solution and the peace process. So, like, it's our job, I believe, as people, in solidarity with Palestine, to hold the government to account, to make sure that their speeches about peace and human rights are backed up by tangible actions to tackle Israel's human rights abuses. And to that end, I suppose I will say that I think the Occupied Territories Bill is a useful tool in that struggle, is a very useful tool in that struggle. And I, and I do look forward to the day when we see it enacted um, and that the Irish state begins to live up to its promise to stand up for justice, uh, self-determination and the rights of, of small nations. So I suppose... That's our, that's, I think, going forward, it's, it's apartheid. What's happening now is a, it's an apartheid situation and enough is enough. And we must never, ever, ever give up. I would hate to water that down with anything I could say. I would never say it as well. So um, all I'm going to say at this stage is Senator Francis Black, uh, Omar Shakir, uh, Human Rights Watch Director for Israel and Palestine. Thank you so much both for being here with us and discussing this important topic. We are very much looking forward to the work we'll be doing together on this and hopefully much else 
besides. Um, to all of those of you, to all those of you who watched us, please visit stopsettlements.org, sign the ECI if you're a European Union citizen, um, and take the other steps on the website to see how you can be involved. Visit the M25, visit Human Rights Watch, follow the work of uh, of Francis and others, um, and see how we can all be part of the solution and stand in solidarity with uh, Palestinians and people of occupied lands everywhere in the world. Thank you very much for watching, and see you next time. Thank you.